It's always a crapshoot. So good morning, guys. We are live with Environmental Social Justice. Thank you so much yet again in this mid-March day. Today, we are introducing Miss Natalie Ambrosio Prudhomme. She's with a company called 427, recently acquired by Moody's. And they primarily do environmental, social governance and ratings. And she has a, one thing I love about Natalie is her background actually is in environmental. So she's not a CPA that decided to get into environmental. She's not an economist that decided to get into environmental. She's actually an environmental person that went into communications, that went into finance, which is utterly fabulous. I'm also introducing Ms. Joy Langford, our environmental consultant. Hi. And Mr. Joel, Joel Vendette, our in-house realtor, but also renewable energy expert. So Natalie, please tell us about 427 Moody's, what you guys are working on. You said you recently lost that Moody's launched their climate offering solutions. So yeah. please tell us all about it. Yeah, will do. And thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. As you mentioned, I definitely, I studied environmental science and communications, had my background in climate adaptation, and environmental science, and then took that to communicating that to the financial sector. Um, so definitely excited to be here. So 427, uh, originally we focused specifically on physical climate risk analytics. So distilling um, huge volumes of climate risk data down into understandable uh, numbers that could be useful for decision making for the financial sector. So investors, banks, businesses as well to really help them understand okay, in 20, 30 years, how am I going to be at risk, exposed to the impacts of heat stress, floods, hurricanes, uh, the business impacts that they present to either my assets or the assets of companies that I might invest in. And so that's really where 427 started and our specialty in, in that climate risk analytics. And as you mentioned, we were acquired by Moody's and now sit in the relatively new Moody's ESG solutions group. And so that's a part of Moody's that focuses on bringing ESG data on sustainable finance, ESG, as well as climate risk uh, analytics to their clients. And so the last thing I'll say here in the intro is that, as you mentioned, Moody's did launch today the climate solutions suite. And yes, we're very excited. This really brings the years of expertise from 427 on physical climate risk data, as well as our fellow Moody's affiliate, VE, um, which is a company focused on ESG um, assessments and also has expertise in transition risk of climate change. So it really brings the years of expertise on climate change from these companies together with Moody's uh, renowned world-class credit risk modeling and economic risk uh, models. So bringing these things together um, to integrate uh, climate change data into credit risk analysis and financial risk modeling. And so, so yeah, that's, I'll stop there for now and happy to dive into more details. One thing, one thing I absolutely love what you guys are doing is most <laughs> companies, businesses, organizations do not understand how climate change is going to affect their day-to-day -day business, where they get supplies from, how they transport their supplies. I myself didn't even consider it i'm you know i'm gonna name drop here but i met tony blair in an event and he was talking about this and i was like oh that's gonna change isn't it how we get our supplies how things are gonna be transported how, where people get them where things are gonna be growing because things are getting hotter when our climate gets hotter agriculture completely changes so um i guess for like businesses just in you know if you can just kind of wrap everything together how does climate change affect their economy. How do you how do you see this going forward? It's like an overall things are going to change and you guys had better understand how. Yeah. So I'll start with just a few high level stats that I think are a little bit eye opening, but then we'll share more details on really what this means for businesses. But research from 427 uh, back in the fall, we found that by 2040, the projected number of people that will be exposed to damaging floods, this is globally, would rise from 2.2 billion people to 3.6 billion people, which is 41% of the global population by 2040 exposed to damaging yeah. floods. And roughly $78 trillion, which is equivalent to 57% of the world's current GDP would be exposed to flooding. That's what our projections are. And that's just one climate hazard, but similar eye-opening numbers um, exist for other climate hazards globally. 
And so the, and one other stat I'll put there is that Moody's Analytics integrated the impacts of chronic climate change into their macroeconomic modeling. And they found that under a two degree scenario, this is by 2100, climate change could cost $69 trillion to the economy. So these are huge numbers. Yeah. Uh, and so just to put these huge numbers into then to answer your question around, what does this actually mean for businesses if a business is exposed to floods? It can really have a lot of impacts. So there's perhaps some of the obvious impacts of the actual uh, physical operation site. So if the building is flooded, the operations can't take place there at the building. If there's uh, capital intensive machinery, as an example, and that gets damaged, there's going to be increasing costs going in to repair, replace the, that machinery. However, the thing that's really interesting and, and perhaps a little less thought of is really the rippling impacts, where even if a business's facility is prepared for floods or not flooded itself, uh, if the subway system is flooded, its employees can't get to work. And there's been instances uh, where co companies have had to stop operations at their manufacturing sites, not because those were flooded, but because their employees just couldn't come to work safely because of the damage to the regional infrastructure and systems. And so that's flooding. Hurricanes has similar impacts, both really costly to the asset, but also rippling impacts. And with hurricanes, we see that not just within the community, but globally. Um, when Hurricane Maria hit uh, back in 2017, uh, Puerto Rico uh, manufacturing for pharmaceuticals, a lot of that is concentrated in Puerto Rico. And when those incurred devastating losses um, from the hurricanes, we felt that in the US, in mainland US, um, our hospital supplies were limited. And that the, that's just an example of how these can really be felt globally um, when one piece of the supply chain is affected by a climate hazard. And oh, I just want to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm just agreeing with you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Just the one last thing of, to highlight a different climate hazard, floods, hurricanes, and they all have their different impacts. And heat stress is one that might seem a little more, of course, it's going to have tangible impacts on human health, labor productivity. Um, and in addition to increasing costs and things like data centers um, that rely a lot on energy um, for cooling, and th that's going to present risks in terms of potential um, blackouts or brownouts during increased energy demand during heat waves, but also just increasing costs as increasing average temperatures uh, might lead to increasing energy costs over time. And so, again, there's different examples for all sorts of different climate hazards, um, but I'll, I'll stop there for now with those examples. Well, just so, adding to the, oh, go ahead, Joy, jump in. So, so uh, um, as far as like your Moody's rating goes, like let's say I have a, a, a business and I sign up um, under this environmental program that, that you're implementing, how does that affect my business? What's my bottom line uh, for being environmentally uh, sound as a business? Uh, what are the benefits of it or are there any, short-term benefits as opposed to the long-term benefits, which you've already described. Um, what's the... Yeah, the so so I'll start first by saying that I'm 427 is not part of Moody's Investor Service, which is the credit rating agency. And exactly. I am definitely not authorized to speak on behalf of the credit ratings themselves. Um, but really where we fit in is helping uh, banks, investors, also corporations, understand their what their risk is um, and how they can then un use that understanding to build resilience and prepare for the risk. Um, both, and I would say this has both short-term and long-term long impacts. And one thing we say with uh, real estate investors as just an example is the opportunity to really engage. Um, so engage with the asset operators if they have that relationship with them and help. Maybe they've done this risk assessment. They've purchased access to our uh, climate risk data for the specific assets, as an example. Um, so now they understand that they're at risk. They can use that to really engage with those who are on the ground at the uh, facilities themselves and inform them. And then that can help. Again, this is the this is a high level risk assessment um, that has globally comparable data, but 
they can be used then to go take that to the ground, engage with uh, engineers, those who have really the understanding of what the characteristics of that asset and ask those questions around, okay, we're exposed to flood risk. Um, tell What about the structure here? What are uh, hard measures we can put into place to prepare for flooding, uh, if that makes sense? Makes a lot of sense. So would you be also like working with like the insurance commissions um, in in every state um, to either disseminate information on the program or um, you know help kind of like even shift for lack of a better term like legislation uh, that can be put into a uh, place to better help businesses brace for the environmental changes uh, going on as well as um, what have you. Yeah, well, what we can't, we don't do advocacy ourselves. We definitely are happy to engage with our data and our research. Um, we have spoken at different conferences or events and engaged as thought partners um, on what the risks of climate change are and then how they can inform different actions. As, as we should. This is like really a really important topic, especially as for the business community that's struggling with so much right now, right? including uh, COVID, um, you know, dollars for, um, you know, environmental issues, which your work is, is, is this, this is great. I never even thought along these lines. To add on to that though, one of the things, cause I study mostly wildfires and heat. So when you're talking about businesses and employees, if it's too hot, if the heat is too high, they can't work. They can't be outside working on lines or working on landscaping or working in the field Simultaneously, when fires roll through, that's a total disruption of business, transportation, agriculture, every everything that's connected. I always call it the chain reaction because yep. one thing, one little break in that chain is going to cause a disastrous effect throughout. So that's why this is hugely important. And one of the things, Natalie, I would love for you to talk about is how this will affect resilience because resilience is so important for companies to recover from these climate changes and the effects of the climate change. So what is uh, what is 427 doing with assisting in yeah. that or educating in that. Yeah, that's so important. And just to build on your point about the wildfires for a second too, it's it creates perhaps obvious, very destructive disruptions where a fire takes place. But then to your point, then San Francisco, when we had the fires hundreds of miles away um, up in Northern California, there were business dis disruptions in urban San Francisco due to the smoke. Um, public works products projects couldn't take place. There were so definitely the rippling impacts. Everything is connected. Um, even when your own community might not be on fire itself, literally. Um, and that goes right into your question about resilience. So yeah, 427's mission is really to catalyze investment in resilience. Um, with our approach being that in order to really inform effective resilience strategies, you need to understand uh, what your risk is. And so our efforts to really inform whoever they may be, again, um, investors, banks, businesses, inform them about their risk in a way that's really in forward looking. So projected out to about mid-century to inform, again, this long-term resilience, trying to help them think about the long term, I, this isn't that long term, but again, when you're ta we're talking in the financial sector, we kind of have to bridge bridge oh, yeah. the gap here between their typical short term angle with the long term elements of climate change and and meet in the middle somewhere. Um, but thinking about the all of the the externalities and the wider communities, um, their resilience, and so we always frame the data around opportunities to use what they understand about risk to ask targeted, targeted questions about resilience and to take in mind the wider community. Like I was saying at the beginning, it's become clearer and clearer that a business's uh, resilience doesn't just depend on its own resilience at its asset. It actually depends on the whole community. And even for things like you were talking about with heat stress, if the if employees go home somewhere where they aren't able to recover at night with no air conditioning um, during extreme heat events, they're not going to be as productive um, or healthy when they come to work. And so thinking through opportunities for businesses to engage uh, with the communities around these solutions that really have benefits for both the community and the business 
uh, is definitely an important opportunity there. Yeah, this is brilliant. As a former investment banker, um, you know, I, I, I've seen it all, but people don't break it down or co companies or nonprofits don't break it down to the investment banking world uh, in a make sense way. And I mean, what you are proposing actually uh, can save millions of dollars on the front end for large corporations if they follow your path. I, this is this is intriguing. I'm it's sorry, Joel. Did you say something? Oh no, but I think I, I'm actually loving the hearing is that we're talking about, or what you're actually focusing on is that, that it's not just at the corporate level as far as how the corporations are impacted, but it's also about how their employees' lives are being impacted as well. Because I think that gets overlooked a lot because without the employee, you have no company. It's right. that's just math. I mean, it, that's science. Eh? Mm -hmm. That's science. But I mean, it's like, so to hear you talking about whether the employees can't get to the work, you know, can't get to work or we can't do this or they're going home and they're sleeping in a place that has no AC. Meanwhile, they're dealing with bonfires. They're not going to be able to come back into work. And then we got the health implications of this. So it, it really is focusing it not from the top down, but really looking at it from the bottom up, which is kind of where it really should have always been, no matter what business you're in. It's like because trickle down never works no matter what you're doing. It has to be a bottom up situation. Um, when you're starting a company, you start at the bottom and you build up. So it's amazing how that works. But so I mean, I love hearing that there's an actual sheet, that there's a big emphasis on the quality of life for the employees as well, because I think that's massive. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, that bottom up element has been a really important part of our data and analysis. We our database on company risk exposure is based on an underlying data set of about 2 million, um, public facility or facilities owned by these companies and really with the understanding that a company's risk is going to be based on the exposure at the ground to heat stress hurricanes what have you of their facilities so really on using this climate science to understand the exposure on the ground and then aggregating that up so yeah you have a global view of that company's exposure but it's based on their specific location specific exposure so i do have a really quick question for you so as of we know the past year everything in the world kind of changed a little bit for that little COVID thing that happened mm -hmm. in case you didn't hear about it. Um, so how do you feel as more and more companies are becoming remote? I mean, we don't know if they're going to stay that way. Uh, fingers crossed that they actually do. But, you know, how is that going to impact the way you approach things as people are working remotely or we've got things like that? And then also consumerism is a huge driving factor behind what we're seeing as far as the global economy and the environmental app you know, implications from that. How do you see those two items changing? Yeah, so for the first question around working remote, I think that's a really interesting element. And as you said, it has positive indications as far as the uh, carbon emissions element. And I think for the resilience element, it brings up a lot of questions around uh, understanding companies' risk exposure if it's actually not based on their corporate office, but based on a hundred different employees offices um, that, that does bring up challenges and analysis and potential challenges around resilience um, because then you don't only need a generator and good systems at the office but you need to make sure all of your employees uh, home offices have uh, consistent power despite hazards or what have you so that brings up a challenge from that perspective i will say that a lot of the uh, companies and sectors that are we look at as really vulnerable and high risk are those like the manufacturing sector, uh, as an example, where I would say it, those operations need to take place on site, um, which is one of those things that already makes them more vulnerable um, to climate risks. But for that element, I think from the data perspective, a lot of the data will still provide a good indication of those companies' risks based on their facilities. Um, but yeah, that's a definitely a good point. And then the other question was about consumerism. Yeah, because we're all, now that everybody is working home remotely, yeah. we're basically saying, I want to deliver to my house in two hours. So that's obviously going to be driving up more for the international trade as well as the manufacturing side of it. So I mean, all these, they're all interconnected as you were saying before. And so it's like yeah. from that ground level, I want yeah. it in my hand now. And I think that just shines light on the importance of the supply chains in the transportation sector um, in particular. Yeah. We've in the past done a decent amount of research on ports, just as one example, and their significant exposure to sea level rise um, in addition to hurricanes and 
other hazards. Uh, and just that's going to become increasingly important as global trade just continues to become more and more connected and at higher demand. Uh, though the resilience of those transportation nodes is going to really be important. So we need to upgrade our transportation our infrastructure <laughs> you haven't heard that before <laughs> no no never that's a new one i thought we were in really great shape <laughs> <laughs> but it's a matter of really taking into account what the forward-looking climate projections yeah. are when we're making those investments because these are long-term investments with a lot of capital intensive infrastructure that they're meant to last for the next decades and if they don't take these forward-looking information into account then it's it's going to be a problem understatement of a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be devastating. <laughs> so we've reached our 20 minutes. I wanted to close out real quick. Like Joy, did you want to add on anything from like your government policy perspective per se, since that's your expertise? Well, you know, I'm not a forecaster. Uh, I'm a, I am an economist by training. Um, but I see that um, what Natalie is doing is, is just the, the forethought of policy fo following right behind her uh, and their organization. So I think it's going to be a natural fit. I look forward uh, to uh, seeing how uh, you guys progress. And um, I think the policy is going to follow right behind you. Uh, with incorporating uh, these types of programs um, on a larger level uh, for corporations. I can see that it can also kind of levy the playing field as opposed to government dictating to companies what they must do. If they follow your policies and procedures, uh, companies get a little bit better of a leeway. So I think it can kind of moderate the, the, the conversation uh, about business versus government. So, yeah, I hope you come back and 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 tell us what the progress of it is because I think a oh, lot absolutely. of people in the investment banking community would really really be interested in knowing uh, how you're working this. Oh, absolutely. And just to add on to that, um, this is relatively new, and most people that work in ESG do not have environmental background. Either they were just told by their bosses, "Hey, you're a new environmental person," which is not fair to them or they just think environment's kind of easy because it's a bunch of trees, not necessarily true. So thank you for having the environmental background. Thank you for pushing this to the forefront for businesses to understand how there is a chain reaction to everything that we do from heat change to floods, to fires, to hurricanes, to storm surges, to particulate matter that we're breathing in. This is affecting everyone throughout the entire manufacturing chain, building chain, everything. Um, I would love to see where we are in six months to see, you know, what kind of positive nudge we can give companies to adopt this and understand how important it is. And um, on that, I will say thank you. And Joel, did you want to add in anything on your end? No, I think that was actually really cool. But I would just say it's going to come down to the money. It always boils it's down always to the money. Yeah. I mean, and it just does. It's around making a business case for for mm -hmm. these investments that in the long term it will save money. Yeah. Long term it will absolutely save money. That's been proven. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've awesome. researched it. <laughs> but, yep. but thank you, Natalie, so much. And thank you to 427 and Moody's and everything you guys have done. And keep pushing forward and keep trying to change the world. We need it. So Yeah, and thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. And we will see you again soon. And have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody.